Shortly after the massacre in Norway, the media started searching for scapegoats. Certainly they said, oh, it had to be the work of a Christian. They always do that. But then they began to put part of, an, uh, of the blame on an influential American blogger. Dale Hurd has that story. Some news articles about the killings have suggested that accused mass murderer Anders Breivik was inspired by a handful of bloggers who write about the dangers of Islam on the internet. Breivik sought to kill members and supporters of Norway's ruling Labour Party, which he believes has allowed Norway to be Islamicized. And the press has zeroed in on one respected Islamic expert in particular, Robert Spencer, who blogs on the website jihadwatch.org. Tonight, officials are poring over this 1,500-page manifesto that Breivik wrote. He quoted heavily not only from America's Unabomber, but American bloggers like Robert Spencer, who shares his suspicion of Islam. Spencer is the author of 10 books, including the New York Times bestsellers The Truth About Muhammad and The Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam. He also leads seminars on Islam and Jihad for the U.S. military, the FBI, and the intelligence community. Critics of Islam have long been accused of hate speech, and some believe the Norway massacre is now being used as an excuse to further stifle criticism of Islam. Well, joining us now is a prolific author. man has written, I believe, 10 books. He's got a blog out about Islam. He has uh, studied for almost 30 years, uh, is, uh, 20 years or so, uh, Islamic uh, thought. And uh, he's here with us today. Robert Spencer, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Likewise, thank you. Tell me what it is about the uh, media today that seems to be in favor of radical Islam. Why, why do they want to put down anybody who uh, tells the truth about this, or, this uh, cult? Well, I tell you, I think the unpleasant truth about it is, is that the media being hard left is essentially anti-American. And so anything that's American, that's Western, that's Christian, that's Judeo-Christian, they hate. And so they see Islam and it's non-Western and non-Christian and they love it. Well, how can they love murderers? These people are murderers. They kill American soldiers. They kill innocent civilians. Well, you know, to be sure, it's not that they're approving of that directly, because they are propagating the uh, propaganda line that Islam is a religion of peace that's been hijacked by a tiny minority of extremists, and they constantly gloss over and sometimes outright deny the fact that Islamic jihadists use the texts and teachings of Islam to promote violence and to incite peaceful Muslims to commit acts of violence. These well, things well, are matters of fact. It's pretty obvious from what jihadists themselves say. You wrote a book about Muhammad. You have studied carefully his writings, and uh, he wrote the uh, Quran. And what does the Quran have to say, and what did he have to say about jihad? Well, Pat, the Quran says that Muslims should wage war against Jews and Christians. This is chapter 9, verse 29. It says that Muslims should wage war against people of the book, that is, primarily Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya, which is a special tax that Muslims are exempt from paying, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. And that verse became the foundation for a whole elaborate superstructure in Islamic law that uh, it mandates a second-class status for Jews and Christians in Islamic societies so that they're denied basic rights. And even though that's not fully enforced around the world today, in Pakistan and in Egypt and elsewhere, there is a systematic institutionalized form of discrimination against the native Christians in the country so that they can't get good jobs, they can't build new churches or repair old ones, and they're subject to all sorts of forms of legalized harassment and discrimination. You know, I read something the other day. One of these writers was saying, well, uh, if uh, the, the Muslims take over, they'll, they'll give... Uh, everybody demi status like that was a big deal did you talk about that <laughs> Well, people, you know, it is funny that people talk about that as if it's a positive. And a lot of times I've heard Islamic apologists say it means that uh, Jews and Christians are exempt from military service in the Islamic State. And isn't that great? But it's not that they're exempt from military service because they're some sort of privileged class. They're exempt from military service because they're not trusted and they're not really full citizens. And they are uh, made to pay this tax that the, non -Mus that the Muslims don't actually pay. As a matter of fact, if you look back at the great Islamic empires of the past when they were the military powerhouses, it was the non-Muslim communities within those states that paid for that expansion and that military, but they weren't able to serve in it themselves, and they uh, were, were made to pay this tax as a sign of their humiliation and disgrace because they had rejected Muhammad and Allah.
Well, uh, l let's talk about um, the so-called caliphate. Do the ones today, I mean, the majority of Muslims actually believe that they will establish a caliphate that will extend from sea to sea? Well, I don't know if it's a majority in the United States. That's really hard to determine. But I can tell you that the Muslim Brotherhood has been dedicated. As a matter of fact, the Muslim Brotherhood, which is an international Islamic organization, was founded in 1928 in order to restore the caliphate, which was abolished by the secular Turkish government in 1924. And they have their best shot at doing that now than they've ever had, because they're about to come to power in Egypt, and they have allied organizations about to come to power in Tunisia, in Libya, in Yemen, and possibly in Syria and elsewhere. And uh, these are all organizations that want to unite the Islamic world under a caliphate. And so I think it's very likely that they're going to try. I, one of our guys, we do a lot of work uh, in uh, Arabic-themed programs in the Muslim world. And uh, the head of that working for our organization says he thinks that the foundations of Islam are crumbling because people are hearing the truth uh, on the Internet and through the various media that are out there today and that they're, they've been brainwashed for many years. Now, now there's a, a turning away from the extreme form of Islam. Is, is this true or not? Oh, absolutely, Pat. It's 100% true. Uh, I have information that there are several hundred thousand people in the Islamic world who have secretly converted to Christianity. They have to do it in secret because Islam forbids conversion. Muhammad said, if anybody changes his religion, kill him. And there's actually a death penalty on somebody who leaves Islam and becomes a Christian or leaves Islam even and becomes an atheist or, or, or anything else. And in the uh, Islamic world, that makes for a very brittle culture that can't stand any kind of criticism because it, uh, it, 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 they, they know that it won't stand up to scrutiny, and so they have to try to, uh, they, well, in this case, they try to demonize anybody who speaks the truth about the elements of Islam that jihadists use to justify violence, and that's why they're trying to blame me for Norway. And also, they uh, have to close off any kind of uh, uh, questioning of their own doctrine because they know it won't stand up. But people are seeing through it. It's hard in this Internet age to block the truth out and so a lot of people are getting the word out and as that number begins to grow I think that ultimately they're not going to have to live in hiding the way they do now well, last question how about you are you threatened do you, do you have uh, death threats against you or are there fatwas issued against you Yes, Pat, I have many, many, and as a matter of fact, uh, since this Norway thing I've gotten four new death threats and uh, I expect they'll continue to come in What do you do to protect yourself? So I trust the Lord. Well, you know, uh, when I go out and speak in public, I do have a guard. But uh, ultimately, I think uh, these kinds of things are in the hand of God. And uh, I think that when it comes down to it, it's not as if I'm not going to die if I stop telling the truth. So I might as well tell the truth and just let the chips fall where they may. <laughs> Robert, thank you very much. And may the Lord keep you safe. Thank you. Thank you.